so good morning. Before I start, let me say that I can log on to this system. Uh, there is a bug here in the screen. So if you cannot hear me, I cannot activate the microphone. If you cannot hear me, just let me know. OK? Um, so today I'd like to um, discuss the concept of magnetic energy, again, uh, drawing upon what we have seen in electrostatics. Before I start, any questions on our previous lectures? Questions? OK. So let me remind you that uh, we had first talked about this notion of energy and work when we were introducing uh, the voltage. So voltage, that is potential difference between two points, in an electrostatic field. So the voltage, let's say, between points A and B, uh, VB minus VA, in a region where there is a field, an electrostatic field, and these are the electric field lines, okay. uh, was uh, equal to this formula uh, my, of an integral uh, minus A to B E dot DL. But it has a certain physical interpretation. So voltage is work done per unit charge to move a charge from point A to point B against the force of the field. If you remember when we introduced this formula, we had said that one can imagine a charge Q multiplying and dividing this quantity. So voltage is basically work done per unit charge. So this work is stored as energy in the electrostatic field itself. That is what we had seen back then. So when you have uh, a, charge dq, and you want to move it across some voltage V, just like you do in uh, circuit elements, like an inductor, a capacitor, a resistor, where you have, uh, let's say, in a resistor or in an inductor or in a capacitor, uh, the current I and some voltage V across the terminals of this element, right? So that is... Uh, the, the presence of a current means that there are charges that are moving across this potential. Then that means from the definition of the voltage, from the definition of the voltage, that you need to spend work that is equal to V times dQ. And that's where this uh, fundamental circuit relation that power is equal to V times I comes from. Because if you divide this by time, that is if you take the time rate uh, at which you need to spend work to do this, to support the current through the element, then this uh, time rate of work is what we call power. And that is now V times I. So these are some fundamental considerations about the notion of work and power. So now, how did, that, did this manifest, let's say, in structures in electrostatics like the capacitor? Um, again, uh, staying with electrostatics, I would say that uh, in a capacitor, where we have, if we see the capacitor as a circuit element, let's say we have uh, some voltage V and a current I, capacitance C, you know from uh, circuits that there is a voltage-current relation between the uh, current and the voltage at the capacitor that is connected through the capacitance. We saw, though, that these capacitors have physical realizations. In general, a capacitor is 
a system of two conductors. We saw this last time as well. And in this system of two conductors, there is an electric field. The electric field lines have to start from the one conductor to the other and leave the positive conductor at 90 degrees and meet the negative conductor, negatively charged conductor, at 90 degrees. So here we have electric field. And obviously, to put this system together, which may have been a parallel plate system, so this can have a, a realization that is this parallel plates that we had analyzed quite a bit in electrostatics. So this can be now the positively charged uh, conductor and negatively charged conductor. So these general conductors can as well be just plates, uh, planar uh, conductors. Uh, obviously, we have stored energy here. And that's why uh, we use capacitors to store energy as well. We charge them with batteries, and then we discharge them through other circuits. I had done a demonstration in class, if you remember, back then. And um, the reason that there is energy here is that to put together this charge distribution, you need to bring charges in the conductor. Uh, that is the work that is done by the source. If you do this through a voltage source, the voltage source has to push charges on this conductor against repulsive force that the other charges that exist already in the conductor exert on the new charges. So if you want to build, let's say, a, a charge uh, of 10 nanocoulombs uh, on this conductor, when there is 9 nanocoulombs already, and you want to bring the 10th, the 9 will already repel the one extra nanocoulomb you're trying to bring. And then the voltage source has to do that work of pushing the 10th nanocoulomb against the force, the repulsive force of the other 9. So therefore, there is energy stored in the uh, capacitor. And that energy stored can be found, again, through these uh, same considerations. So energy stored in the capacitor can be calculated by saying that uh, Again, dW is VdQ. Uh, we know from the definition of uh, the capacitance that C is Q over V. So dQ is C dV. Remember that the capacitance does not depend on the charge, does not depend on the voltage. That's the whole point that we care about the capacitance. The capacitance depends only on the materials that you use to put the capacitor together and the geometry. If it, uh, when you uh, buy a capacitor of 10 nanofarads, it's not conditional upon how much charge will, you will use to charge it or how much voltage you will connect to its terminals. It is what it is and depends only on the materials and the geometry. Therefore, this is a constant as I vary, as I vary, the, as, as I vary the charge. So dQ is equal to CdV. I can replace this and I have C times V dV. So then if I want to find the total energy that is stored in the capacitor, and this is energy stored in the electrostatic field of the capacitor, I simply need to integrate this from zero voltage to the voltage of the capacitor. Let's say the voltage of the capacitor is V0. So I integrate my voltage from zero in initially to V0. So that gives you 1 half C V0 squared. And that is the energy stored in the capacitor. And back then, we had also provided, and you may remember it also from your midterm, that we had also provided a general formula about energy stored in an electrostatic field, which we showed that in the case of the capacitor, it gives you an equivalent result. And that general formula, that general formula, is that 
the energy stored in an electrostatic field, let me just write it here, field is equal to, and now we're talking about a volume where the field is um, supported. So we have to integrate over the entire volume where the field is supported this quantity, one half d dot e dv. And d dot e uh, can be also expressed because d is epsilon times electric field. That can also be the integral 1 half epsilon magnitude of electric field squared integrated over the entire volume where the field is supported. In fact, uh, you can use this formula in a capacitor to find the capacitance because you can calculate the energy stored and say that this is equal to one half CV squared and from that find the capacitance. I will remind this to you in an example um, in uh, magnetism where we have exactly the same uh, process. So this is the electrostatic side of things. Now in magnetostatics, if I switch from a capacitor to an inductor, So in an inductor, of inductance L that we have defined last time as flux through the inductor divided by the current that generated the flux. This is the self-inductance of that inductor. We'll see uh, more examples today on this. The relation between the voltage and the current is di by dt, L di by dt. So if I go back here in this same formula, that tells me that amount of work to move a differential charge dq across potential v is dw equal v dq. So if I do the same thing here, dw is equal to v times dq, then I can replace v with L di over dt. Uh, yes, please, sorry. Uh, how did you get the formula uh, 1 over 2 d dot e dv? So this one I provided. I didn't prove. So I'm saying that this is a formula that we don't prove here, but uh, it can be proven. And it gives you the electrostatic energy stored in the field. So if you are interested in how to show this, I, uh, we can uh, talk offline. So now you can recognize dq over dt as the current. And this is uh, where we, uh, we are when we uh, basically replace dq over dt with the current uh, through the inductor. And now if you integrate the energy that you are building inside the inductor, uh, starting from current zero to current I, here is what you get. So this is now energy stored in the magnetic field because in the inductor you have a magnetic field. So this is now magnetostatic energy density energy. And I need to do exactly the same. You see the duality between the two processes. So let's say I, my current here is I naught, the final current in the inductor, I di. So this integral is 1 half I squared. And this is my final result, 1 half Li squared. So you see all these are based upon the fundamental uh, definition of voltage as work done per unit charge. All this uh, comes together, things that you have seen uh, probably already in circuit analysis. 
And the corresponding to this general formula in magnetism is very similar. So D correspond is electric flux density, B is magnetic flux density, E is electric field intensity, H is magnetic field intensity, and this is now the formula for magnetic energy in a magnetic field, which uh, you can also write replacing uh, B as uh, mu times H as mu H squared dV. So you can also identify, as we had done back then, uh, what is integrated, like this quantity here, as lowercase we, that is the volume density of energy. And this is likewise lowercase wm. So we, lowercase we, lowercase wm are the densities of energy that you need to integrate in order to find the total energy that is stored. Okay. So this is uh, the theory. And now I will do examples so that we uh, basically consolidate these concepts. Any questions up to this point? OK, so I let it sink in for a moment until I erase also the board here and put my first example. And I will leave this uh, last part with uh, the formulas for magnetostatics. So this is, uh, here is my first example. Energy stored in parallel plate inductor. So the geometry is the one that we saw in the last lecture. And uh, we have one plate of width w, length l, and at a distance h. So this is the magnetic analog of the parallel plate capacitor. So at height, at the distance h, sorry we have this second plate. So this is at z equal 0. This is z equal h, w, l. So this is the z axis. Uh, in fact, let me follow my uh, previous system that the x axis is this. Then the y axis is this one. So then uh, this is a very uh, standard type of uh, structure that we encounter in, uh, for example, in printed circuit boards. So you have a top conductor, a lower conductor, and you are interested in finding the inductance, as we did last time, and now the energy uh, uh, that is uh, stored in the system. Uh, I feed it with current I in the top plate. And there is a return current, minus i, in the bottom plate. And uh, let's say the in-between space is filled with a material of magnetic permeability mu naught, uh, mu, mu naught, mu r. So we have seen with Ampere's law that uh, in this uh, structure, the magnetic field would be pointing towards the y direction, that is, into the board, would be supported only in between 
the two plates and is equal to y hat i over w uh, for z between 0 and h and 0 elsewhere. So we have uh, a situation that is very similar to the one in the parallel plate capacitor, where the electric field is only into the uh, in only between the plates. If you want to find the direction of the magnetic field, because I see uh, many uh, people trying their fingers, uh, so one way to actually qualitatively find where the magnetic field points is to see this current as an assembly of straight wires. So imagine we put this plate together by putting many straight wires together. Just like uh, this wall has been put together, you see, with many columns that are close to each other. Okay, oh, right there, that one over there. I don't know why they are uh, there, probably for acoustics, I don't know. But uh, if you imagine that these plates are just a bunch of wires close to each other, each wire we know that it creates a magnetic field that uh, rotates around the wire according to the right hand rule. So we have current flow, uh, then the magnetic field just around the wire. So as we have all these magnetic field lines generated in this direction, as we argued when we solved this problem with uh, Ampere's law, uh, their superposition will give you this straight magnetic field lines that will go along the y-axis. So uh, we can uh, we can see this also looking at the structure from here. Uh, something I wanted to remind you is whenever you are looking at magnetic fields and you want to understand their direction, it's very productive to actually look at the direction where the current comes towards you. So let's say from this direction here, if I draw uh, the structure on the YZ plane, so I'm looking from this side. So I see the y-axis going to the right, and I see the z-axis coming up. And then the current comes towards me. So the top current looks like this. The top current here looks like this. Comes towards me. And then the bottom current goes into the board. So that is what I see if I plot if I uh, draw the same structure from um, the ZY plane. And you see now that when these currents come out, they will generate those magnetic field lines that will be circulating like this. Around the currents. And you see that because those currents are so close to each other, the envelope of all these circulating currents becomes a straight line. And that straight line flows in the y direction, as you see here. Okay? That's the y-axis. That's the direction of the straight line. And you can repeat for, for the bottom currents. The bottom currents, uh, again, will have now, see the right-hand rule works like this. The current goes into the board, goes like this. And then we have those bottom currents that give you inside magnetic flux lines that also run along the y direction. So that's why the magnetic fields of the top plate and bottom plate reinforce each other within, in the space in between. And they cancel each other out outside. It's exactly like the electric fields of the parallel plate capacitor. All right. So uh, if we want to calculate the inductance of this, as we have done already, and I will simply repeat for completeness, what is the inductance? That is flux captured by the circuit divided by the current that created the flux. So it is uh, magnetic flux divided by I, by current. So now the magnetic flux is exactly what you see right here. 
So these uniform magnetic field lines that are going through this area of height h and length l. The magnetic field is uniform, so I don't need to integrate to find the flux. The flux generally would be b dot ds. But of course, here we have a trivial case. The magnetic field is constant. The area is L times H. So this simply is mu times I over W times LH. So the um, inductance is phi over I mu LH over W. This is it. And this is typical where you find the flux and the flux is proportional to the current. So then the calculation of the inductance is very easy. You just divide out the current and you have it. So this is the inductance. So how much is the energy? This general formula tells me, so now I, I'm not using this uh, right away. I will apply this formula, 1 half mu h squared, to find the total uh, energy in there. And I will simply confirm that it is equal to 1 half Li squared. So the energy density is 1 half mu h squared h is i squared over w squared. So this is energy per unit volume per cubic meters, that is. And to find the energy itself, I need to integrate this over the entire volume, over the entire box. So over this box. That is my inductor. So total energy is this integral that we saw before of energy density over the entire volume. Here, the energy density happens to be constant. So the total energy will be simply this constant times the entire volume of the box. So the volume is width times length times height. Okay. So as you see, uh, the width partially cancels out. And we have 1 half mu LH over W times I squared. So you see this is an alternative way to calculate the inductance. Instead of going and doing this process here, I could have as well, instead of, instead of doing this, okay, I could have as well started from here. And I could say, I calculate the magnetic energy. I find the energy here. I know the energy is 1 half Li squared, so this is L. You see, this and this give me the same answer. OK, so that is, uh, again, that is a trivial case uh, where everything is constant, so there is no integral to do. Uh, but uh, hopefully illustrates the concept of how we get from inductance to energy and back. Yes, please. So, I'd like to ask how you got 1 half i over this i squared. Yes, uh, so uh, this calculation I had done uh, back with Amper's law. Okay. And, and uh, what is i over w is the, uh, the surface current density on the conductor. So, if you refer back to our Amper's law examples, uh, we had uh, expressed this problem as surface current density Js on this uh, plate and surface current density minus Js on this plate. 
And I simply say if the total current now that is carried by the conductor is I, the surface current density will be this current I divided by the width of the, over what, which the current is flowing, which is W. Okay. So that is, uh, uh, because remember what is the surface current density, right? The surface current density is, it comes about from a volume current density. Let's say if you have a, a conductor of height H and width W uh, with a volume density J naught, how much is the current there? It's, uh, I know I have said this multiple times, but uh, it's not uh, bad to repeat. So if you had a volume current density in amps per meter squared, that would be J naught times the cross section. Now if you imagine the height going to zero, just like in PCBs, where the height here of the conductor goes to zero, you don't even know, you don't even see that there is a height on this conductor, on these conductors here, right? So this is a very practical case of a printed conductor where the height goes to zero. To sustain a finite answer from this formula, J naught goes to infinity. So a physical quantity goes to infinity when its physical meaning is lost. And the loss of the physical meaning in this case comes from the fact that if I look at this guy, I don't even see a volume. I see it as a surface. So the volume density as a meaning loses its concept and that's why we take this product that remains finite and we uh, define the surface current density. And that's why whenever you have a surface current density, you want to map it back to the current. You basically have to say it's current over width through which it flows. So the height has been lost and now you have only the width. Okay. Any other questions? So that was my first example. Uh, second example uh, is uh, the toroid. Again, uh, I had uh, talked about this before, but uh, now we will see it from the perspective of the inductance and the magnetic energy. We had seen it in Ampere's law uh, for uh, the calculation of the magnetic field. So the toroid is this. Uh, structure where you have uh, a torus uh, this is uh, the z axis and uh, i have uh, wires that wrap around this torus like this So N wires, each one carries current I. And uh, the material of this torus has magnetic permeability mu. Uh, so they wrap around. Uh, you can also see those uh, wires. So they are coming back and they uh, reappear on the surface like this. So if you want to see the uh, cross section of this torus, just to make it a little bit more uh, clear, uh, the cross section looks like this. We have uh, the material of the torus, the air gap in the middle. This is a z-axis. Uh, this is the other side. So that's now the, the cross-sectional view. If you cut the structure on the uh, plane of the board. And uh, we see the currents coming like this. And as we saw with Ampere's law, the magnetic flux lines are circulating around and they are going like this. 
maybe I should use a different color. So this is the magnetic flux lines are circulating inside like this. So at the cross section, we see the magnetic flux lines coming out from the left. and going into the board from the right. And if you want to see it from the top, from the top, just to complete the, uh, the picture, the top view of this is those two circles. Radius A is the inner circle, radius B the outer circle. Uh, from this side, the currents are coming out. Those N wires are coming out. And from the outer conduct, uh, on the outer side of the torus, the uh, currents are going down and into the board. Okay, so this is the structure, and to complete it, the magnetic flux lines are circulating like this. Inside the material. That's how the magnetic flux lines look like. Okay. All right. So we have N wires, we have N turns as well. Uh, each wire has a turn, right? So um, from each turn, we have this magnetic flux that goes through. So let's uh, first calculate the inductance. We can do both problems here in this case, both the inductance and the magnetic energy. So I, I will follow exactly the same route. First calculate the inductance and then uh, find the magnetic energy and confirm that magnetic energy is one half L I squared. So let's do that uh, first. Uh, the magnetic field, we had calculated, you can do this from Ampere's law here, it's exactly on this route. So from Ampere's law, if you refer back to uh, the lecture on Ampere's law, the magnetic field inside the torus is H phi to pi r equals to n times i. So we have uh, this circulating magnetic field that is number of wires times the current, that is the total current, divided by 2 pi r. So this is it. So through one turn, I have magnetic flux that I can calculate. Uh, so let me find the magnetic flux through one turn. So magnetic flux through one turn. Let's see how much this is. So you see the magnetic flux lines, they are going through this turn. This is precisely the magnetic flux that I will calculate. I uh, will redraw the geometry here. So this is the turn of the wire. Uh, the magnetic flux lines are coming like this out of the board. They are in the phi direction. This is at r equals a, this is at r equals b. And let me also introduce coordinates in the uh, z direction uh, that this is uh, z equals 0. And the height of the torus is z equal h. So you see that I have uh, this rectangular cross-section around which I'm wrapping these wires. So the magnetic flux can be found by integrating. So again, this is for one turn. Uh, 
the magnetic field, the magnetic flux density. So the magnetic flux density is mu times the intensity. I have the intensity here. Ni by 2 pi r, phi hat. So when you see that the magnetic flux is in the phi direction, your ds should also be in the phi direction. That's uh, what magnetic flux means. You go in the direction of the magnetic flux density, and you put a differential surface um, area element, ds, and you do the calculation of b dot ds. So the corresponding ds here is the one that points in the phi direction, and that is dr dh. Uh, sorry, dz, dr dz. So basically, it is an element like this. This is dr, this is dz, and I will be moving this area up and down throughout this turn to calculate the total flux. So you see phi dot phi is equal to 1. dr dz tell me that I integrate over r and over z. So I will vary r from a to b and z from 0 to h. In the meantime, mu n to pi are constants, so I take them out. And I have one integral from a to b of dr over r and another integral from 0 to h of dz. So this is a logarithm, lmb over a, and this is h. So all in all, the uh, flux through one turn is i times mu times n by 2 pi ln b over a times h. Now, once we have uh, the flux through one turn, then we need to compute what is called flux linkage. It's regrettable that it has a separate name, flux linkage, lambda. It simply means that now that I have n turns, I need to multiply this flux by n. Because this is the flux through one turn of the wire. But the wire has n turns. So the flux linkage, which is a total flux, so this is uh, what is called flux linkage lambda, is basically n times this. And that is equal to, again, current i, I uh, leave it separately, n squared divided by 2 pi times h times the logarithm of b over a. And that gives me the inductance. The inductance here, you see if you have multiple turns, then inductance is the total flux through all the turns divided by current. So that's why I had to uh, do this multiplication times n. Uh, so the inductance of the toroid is uh, this total flux over the current, which is uh, mu n squared h over 2 pi ln b over a. OK, so this is the inductance. I could as well calculate the energy. Before I get to the energy, any uh, questions on this? OK. So here is now the same computation with energy, with magnetostatic energy. So. Again, this is an inductor. It does store energy in the magnetic field. And that energy can be uh, computed by uh, integrating the energy density. So the energy density is 1 half mu h squared.
So the good thing now is that uh, you don't have vectors anymore to worry about. Uh, this is uh, basically magnitude of the magnetic field intensity. I take this and I uh, square it. That's it. I don't have vectors anymore. Okay. And to find the energy, I need to integrate this over the entire torus. over the entire torus. So the corresponding dV, you see that uh, this is all expressed in cylindrical coordinates because of the symmetry and the structure of the torus. So in cylindrical coordinates, dV is r d r d phi dz. So this is the dV in cylindrical coordinates. And you see the R and the R cancels out, uh, partially, the R and the R squared. And uh, I take out the uh, constants. So let me keep one half separately with I squared. And then I have other constants, mu times N squared divided by 4 pi squared. Okay. And then inside the integral, I have integral of dr over r from a to b, integral of d phi. So now phi has to scan the entire torus. So it has to go from 0 to 2 pi. This torus goes all the way. As you see, it, uh, as you see here, this is the clearest picture of it. You go all the way around the z-axis from 0 to 2 pi. So d phi has to be integrated from 0 to 2 pi. And the height goes from 0 to h. So I have a bunch of known integrals. This is again the logarithm. This is 2 pi. Uh, and this is h. And uh, from that, you find 1 half i squared times a factor that you can easily confirm. It is, again, the inductance. So again, I could have found the inductance by calculating the energy instead of uh, going and doing this calculation of the flux linkage. So I could have gone directly. I could have started the problem here, right? found the energy. And then I would express the energy as 1 half i squared times mu n squared. 2 pi and 4 pi squared give me 2 pi. And then I have the logarithm of b over a times h. So you see, again, this is the inductance of the toroid. So it is just a matter of preference or a matter of what the problem says, whether I would go through the first route or the second route. But the point is that those two have to give you the same result. Uh, and uh, always energy being correctly calculated would give you 1 half inductance times uh, current squared. All right, uh, so this is uh, the, the toroid. Uh, any questions? OK, so then that's it for uh, today. Thanks for your attention. Uh, we'll continue tomorrow.